The world is facing an extinction crisis. Approximately 1 million plants and animals are currently threatened with extinction. This is why scientists all over the world are working together on something known as de-extinction. Their goal is to resurrect extinct species, re-establish them in the wild, and in doing so, hopefully help restore the environment to a more natural state. While there are many species being considered right now, some of the big name species being targeted for de-extinction are the mammoth, the thylacine, and the dodo. But can this dream become a reality? Can we really resurrect species and help save the environment? What sort of challenges do we need to overcome to make this happen? And what will it cost? Well, in this video, I'm going to try and answer some of these very tricky questions. Let's begin by briefly explaining how scientists propose de-extinction might work. There are actually multiple proposed methods for de-extinction, but today I'm going to focus on the method that's being proposed to bring back species like the mammoth and the thylacine. That is, species that have been extinct for a very long time. Technically speaking, a species could be resurrected by cloning DNA from cells collected from their body, similar to processes that were used to clone Dolly the sheep. <laughs> Unfortunately, the DNA samples that we have for most extinct species are pretty incomplete. After thousands of years of sitting frozen in the ground, or decades of sitting in museum collection jars, the DNA we have left for many of these extinct species is degraded, it's fragmented, and it could be missing whole sections of their original genome. Without intact DNA, it would be practically impossible to create an exact clone. So instead, to resurrect an extinct species, scientists are going to try something a little different. First, geneticists will decode as much of the extinct animal's genome as they can using preserved DNA samples. Then, they will use gene editing technology to edit the genome of its closest living relative and transform it or make it match the genome of the extinct species. They will do this by inserting key genes from the extinct species into the genome of its closest living relative. These will be the genes that are essential to making that extinct species unique. For example, the adaptations that allow mammoths to survive in very cold climates. This edited genome will then be transferred into an empty egg cell, and the embryo will be implanted into a surrogate mother. If all goes well, the surrogate mother will eventually give birth to a genetically engineered, formerly extinct animal. For the mammoth, scientists are proposing to edit the genome of its closest living relative, the Asian elephant, and they will use an African elephant as a surrogate mother. For the thylacine, they are going to edit the genome of its closest living relative, the fat-tailed dunnart, but they're going to be using a Tasmanian devil as a surrogate. Now, I am not a geneticist, I am an ecologist, so I am not here to debate whether or not this will work in a lab. In preparation for this video, I spoke to several geneticists about the technical aspects of de-extinction, and they all seem to agree that with enough time, money, and perseverance, this proposed method could eventually work. In five to ten years, we may get to see something that looks more or less like a mammoth for the first time in 4,000 years. But even if we manage this incredible feat of genetic engineering, the question I want to answer is whether or not we will be able to successfully reintroduce these extinct species back into the wild. And will that resurrected species be able to help restore the environment? And the best answer I can come up with is maybe? While this all sounds really exciting, there are some pretty big ecological challenges that we will need to overcome for de-extinction to have the slightest chance of working. One of the key potential issues with de-extinction is that the species that we bring back will not be the same as the species that originally went extinct. This is probably the biggest misconception around de-extinction. Remember when I said that mammoths and thylacines cannot be cloned because we don't have complete and intact copies of their genomes? Well, to fill in these genetic gaps, scientists will be using the DNA of their closest living relatives. This means that the species that are brought back will not be exact genetic copies of the species that originally went extinct. They will be a brand new species that we created in a lab. It will be a genetic hybrid of the extinct species and its closest living relative. This means you can never really bring back a species once it's gone extinct, at least not using the currently proposed techniques. They will create a thylacine-ish thing that's gonna be about 90% thylacine. As for the mammoth, at this point, they're really just trying to create more of an arctic elephant than a true mammoth. To be fair, nobody who is working on de-extinction has claimed that they can bring back an exact genetic copy. Instead, scientists 
scientists want to create proxies, species that are similar enough to the original that they can release them into the wild and they will hopefully fill the extinct species ecological niche or role in the environment. But even this will be tricky because while these de-extinct species will have most of the DNA of their former selves, they could still be missing critical components of their DNA that make them them. It's also important to understand that not all of our traits or behaviors are written into our DNA. This will depend on the species, but some behaviors and knowledge get passed down between generations, so de-extinct species may be missing out on pretty critical pieces of information because they don't have any parents or community. Some of our behaviors and traits can also change because of the way our DNA interacts with the environment. Believe it or not, the environment you live in can change the way your genes work. For example, temperature can affect the activity level or expression of genes in a lot of different species. Take Himalayan rabbits. The gene that controls their fur color is affected by temperature. Himalayan rabbits that are reared in temperatures 20 degrees Celsius or less will have black feet, ears, and a black nose. But rabbits that are reared in 30 degrees Celsius or above will be completely white. This means that even if we could create exact clones of extinct species, unless we can recreate the environment that they used to live in, these resurrected species might look and behave very differently to the original. De extinction also doesn't address the issues that caused the species to go extinct in the first place. Even if we manage to create a healthy population of mammoths or thylacines, it is possible they could struggle to survive in the face of ongoing environmental threats like climate change, human persecution, invasive species, or habitat destruction. Basically, there isn't much point in bringing a species back only to put them into an ecosystem where they could go extinct again. And speaking of ecosystems, we need to remember that the ecosystem we're trying to put the de-extinct species back into may have completely changed. Putting a species that went extinct thousands of years ago into a modern habitat and a much warmer climate might not be that successful. A de-extinct species may simply not be able to adapt to a new and potentially very unfamiliar environment. It is also possible that the ecosystem itself may have adapted or moved on, so to speak, since that species went extinct. For example, other species may have come in to fill the ecological gap that the extinct species left behind. If that is the case, the ecosystem may just not have a place for that extinct species anymore, especially if it's been gone for a really long time. This leads us to the next potential problem. Because if a de-extinct species is released into the wild, it will be very hard to predict how it will affect that ecosystem. Although there are examples of highly successful animal reintroductions, like the reintroductions of wolves into Yellowstone National Park, there are also plenty of examples where reintroductions have not worked. The thing is, if a de-extinct species doesn't have the same DNA as the original, and it's not behaving the same way as the original, then we haven't brought back an extinct species. We've created a brand new one and released it into the wild. Human history is filled with examples where we have introduced foreign species into new environments and it has devastated local wildlife and habitats. Trust me on this one, I live in Australia and we are up to our ears in invasive species around here. Another important question we need to ask ourselves is whether or not de-extinction is worth the cost. Unfortunately, we live in a world of limited resources and there's only so much money for research and conservation projects. This means we need to consider how we can get the best value for money. And research has shown that the financial costs of trying to protect a resurrected species are probably going to be a lot higher than the cost of trying to protect a species that is still alive today. Recent analysis suggests that if the government were to cover the costs of protecting protecting resurrected species, then there would be less money to pay for the conservation of species that are still alive. This would probably result in an overall loss in biodiversity. In fact, roughly two species would go extinct for every one species that we brought back. However, if the costs for maintaining and protecting de-extinct species were paid for by private companies, then current government-funded conservation programs wouldn't lose any funding, and there would probably be an increase in biodiversity. But if those same funds were spent instead on existing conservation programs to protect living species, then we would probably see a much bigger increase in biodiversity. Roughly two to eight times as many species would be saved as would be resurrected. There are also ethical concerns we should probably think about before moving forward with this technology. For
For example, clones are often born in pretty poor health, so it's possible that the first mammoths or thylacines that are born will also not be in very good condition and could die quite young. Another issue is that the surrogates really don't have a say in any of this, and it could be quite dangerous and distressing for the surrogate mothers to give birth to a de-extinct species. Some of the surrogate species that have been suggested are also endangered species themselves. So a good question to ask is whether or not this is the best use of our breeding programs. Also, keep in mind that species like elephants are extremely intelligent and highly social. And while I'm not suggesting that we should value a species based on its intelligence, I can't help but wonder about what the impact would be on an African elephant who gives birth to an Asian elephant slash mammoth hybrid. I also worry that if people think we can just bring species back, then they'll care less about trying to preserve them in the here and now. But then again, maybe de-extinction will get people excited about ecology and more engaged with conservation. I don't pretend to know the answers to any of these questions. I'm just me. I'm just an ecologist, but what I do know is we should probably be thinking about these things before we take too many big steps. Putting this all together, as exciting as the idea of de-extinction is, clearly we have a lot of barriers we're going to have to overcome for this to help the environment. Creating a baby mammoth in a lab, as difficult as that is going to be, is really only just the beginning. From a purely ecological perspective, for de-extinction to be a success, we need to make sure that we're choosing the right species. This means choosing species that went extinct relatively recently, so that hopefully the environment hasn't changed too much. Also, if they've gone extinct in the recent past, then we should have pretty good information on the types of habitats they need and the resources they need. We would also need to make sure that that species has enough suitable habitat not just for today, but under future environmental conditions as well. We also need to make sure that whatever habitat we put this resurrected species into, we ensure that both the species and the ecosystem are safe and healthy. This may mean establishing large protected areas or creating new laws to help protect these species from a range of environmental threats. We will also need to conduct regular monitoring to make sure that the de-extinct species all the other species in that habitat and the ecosystem itself are doing well. And because none of this will be cheap, we will need to think very strategically about where we put our limited resources. We definitely need to keep investing in conserving the species that we still have because this is probably going to be a lot more cost effective and a lot more successful. Okay, everybody, that is it for me this time. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please let me know in the comments below. What do you think of de-extinction? Do you love the idea? Do you hate it? I really wanna hear from you. If you found this video interesting, you might wanna check out this other video I did where I. I talk about the fact that top predators all around the world are going extinct, but there are some things we can do about it. Spoiler alert, one of the things is not de-extinction. I hope you enjoy it, and I'll see you next time.